And that's how time passed for the girl. She blew her nose on the hem of her underwear. She didn't have that delicate thing called charm. I'm the only one who finds her charming. Only I, her author, love her. I suffer for her. And I'm the only one who can say this. What do you ask of me weeping that I wouldn't give you singing? That girl didn't know she was what she was, just as a dog doesn't know it's a dog. So she didn't feel unhappy. The only thing that she wanted was to live. She didn't know for what. She didn't ask questions. Maybe she thought there was a little bitty glory in living. She thought people had to be happy, so she was. Before her birth, was she an idea? Before her birth, was she dead? And after her birth, she would die? What a thin slice of watermelon. Welcome to another episode of Books of Some Substance. I'm your host, Nathan Sharp. And I am your co-host, I suppose, David Southard. And on this episode, we are talking about Clarice Lispector's 1977 novel, or novella, rather, The Hour of the Star. And we are both reading this really excellent New Directions edition. Yeah, I want to call out, I love this, I, not just the book cover, the whole book is a beautiful little piece, and it's wor- like it's kind of expensive for such a little book, but it's kind of worth it, because it's, yeah. I love it. It was designed by Paul Serre, um, who also designed the Chandelier, and has designed some really good books, so I just wanted to give him a shout out, because, um, you know, you do read a book by its cover, and this is a darn good cover. Yeah, it's excellent. So yeah, this book was originally published in 77 in Brazil. I think there was an English translation in 92. And this 92. translation is by Benjamin Moser. Moser? I, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. Yeah, and th- there's been kind of a resurgence in Le Spectre, thanks to New Directions and Ben. I don't know how to say his last name either. Ben Moser. Mm-hmm. The New Directions has since 2011. I think this was the first the Spectre book that they published, but they've since been republishing a lot of her books that have been out of print in English for a while. Yeah. So, And the world is a better place for it. Agreed. So this is our first book of the new season. And <laughs> Nathan, how would you summarize this little work? Well, I like, uh, I like what Clarice Lispector said about it herself it's about a poor girl or it's about a girl who's so poor she only eats hot dogs (laughs) and that's kind of what it's about it's about this uh 19 year old girl in rio de janeiro who's she's a typist and she's just lives in kind of these tenement slums and it's just a a little snippet of her life but in you know in lispector's fashion it's about so much more than that I mean, it, it will get into it. A, a big part of it is is about the 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 narrator. I mean, the narrator is definitely another big character in this book. Yeah. How this narrator r- writes about himself, himself, and writes about the the character of Macabea, who's that that girl in Rio de Janeiro. And it's also about the, a sense of self, about innocence, about what it means to be alive uh and you know in and really there's there's a passage in here that she says that or the narrator says that he's writing it in in such a way that the basically the style becomes the content so i think there's an element of this that's also just about the style of language about what does it mean to try to communicate something through language it's very lispectorish to me the word is the word as the narrator repeats more than once. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the word is the fruit of the word. The yeah. word must resemble the word. <laughs> Which can't help but put you into mind of, you know, in the beginning was the word, Genesis. Which we can get into that particular aspect of the book. I think the narrator has, has an obsession with the relationship to God in, in a strange way. Because it appears in 75 whatever pages, 
the narrator talks about belief and God and makes references to her belief and faith and things. And as we talked before, there's there's maybe some kind of biting of the fruit from the tree of knowledge and an expelling of oneself out of innocence, out of Eden, maybe. Uh, but that that's uh, maybe that's something we get into later. I'm not sure. I've been excited to start talking about this book because it's such it's a tiny book, like you said. It's less than 100 pages. But every sentence she seems to pack with so many I mean, she packs them with ideas, but in this peculiar way. Yeah. Her syntax is all over the place. There's a lot of non sequiturs. The narrator, this man who, from what I remember, goes unnamed, but in the postscript or something that I think her son wrote, he names... He has a name. Yeah, he has I, a name. He introduces himself at the beginning. I think. Oh, does he? Okay, I, I guess I just yeah. forgot it. Like, something SM. I can't remember what his yeah. name was. He is himself a fiction, which is obvious to anyone reading it as a novel. But... Rodrigo SM. Rodrigo, sorry. Yeah, he starts with this idea that he, he doesn't lie when he's writing. He lies when he has to. And what he's going to tell you is the truth, even though it's not real. Or it's real, even though it's not really real. And so he's sort of building this character of Maccabea, but is constantly interrupting the flow of that narrative and that story. Especially early on in the book, the first, I don't know, 15 pages or so, never he's really gets off like... the ground. <laughs> I'm about to tell you a story. I'm going to keep this simple. I'm not going to use high fluting language. I'm just going to tell you the facts, the hard facts, facts that are like hard stones. I'm not even interested in fiction. This is just reality. And he just goes on and on and on and on. And he's like, I can't delay anymore. It's, it's, it's burning burst. me up inside. Yeah. I have, to, I have to tell you. <laughs> yeah. There's this intense desire this to just tell this story, which is not much of a story until maybe the end. It's a sort of character study. I suppose, although you get a little bit of narrative when she has a quote-unquote boyfriend. And he has this, I don't know how you would call it, empathy, but pity, and quite a bit of contempt for Maccabea, at least early on in the, in the narrative. Reading this narrator, I mean, I had to keep reminding myself and the narrator is a, is a man she makes yeah. that clear early on um, but i had to keep reminding myself that this wasn't lispector because it sounds so much like it's the voice of the narrator sounds so real it sounds like somebody struggling to tell a story that they yes. really want to tell it doesn't it doesn't feel like fiction the only part of it that really feels like fiction is the fact that she calls it a man named Rodrigo SM. The rest of it, it could be talking to the author, the specter, about writing the story that she wants to write about, you know, this impoverished woman that she saw by chance on the street and thought, well, there's a story in that face. Also, the specter's photos on the cover of this book, and she's kind of just, she's one of those authors that, her personality seems to kind of imbue her, the aura around her. She's not an author that kind of sits back. Yeah. I mean, even this edition starts with a preface, little mini essay called A Passion for the Void, in which you get a famous author. Um, I don't know how to pronounce this Irish name. Tob Tobin? Who also quotes another famous author, <laughs> I mean, Elizabeth Bishop. And they're all talking about Clarissa Spector. So she has this sort of aura about her as an author and a personality. So it's it it seems hard, it's difficult, I would say, um, not to, not for her to impose something of herself on it, especially when you know it's a fiction. So you're asking yourself, why did she add this layer? Why did she add this male narrator to frame this story? 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, she clearly is having fun with it because mm-hmm. she's allowing herself to play with the idea of storytelling and fiction creating. And she also makes fun of him and he in a little bit. Like, there's a quote early on, which through the narrative voice says, I humbly limit myself without trumpeting my humility, for then it wouldn't be humble. I limit myself to telling of the lame <laughs> adventures of a girl in a city. And he just, like, he has this confidence about himself early on, and she kind yeah. of undermines it. So I think it's just a way for her to sort of have fun at undermining this narrative control over this seemingly lame, lame girl. The, the Just the narrator as a character. I mean, it's also funny, but about halfway through the narrative, the narrator is like, I'm sorry, I need to take a break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he just and then takes a break for three days. The next paragraph. Yeah. <laughs> and then comes right back to the story. I am absolutely tired of literature. Only muteness keeps me company. If I still write, it's because I have nothing better to do in the world while I wait for death. The search for the word in the dark. My small success invades me and exposes me to the glances on the street. I want to stagger through the mud. My need for objection I can hardly control. The need for the orgy and the worst absolute delight. Sin attracts me. Prohibited things fascinate me. I want to be a pig and a hen, and then kill them and drink their blood. I think of Maccabea's sex, mute but unexpectedly covered with thick and abundant black hairs. Her sex was the only vehement sign of her existence. She asked for nothing but her sex made its demands, like a sunflower born in a tomb. As for me, I'm tired. Maybe of the company of Maccabea, Gloria, Olympico. The doctor nauseated me with his beer. I have to interrupt this story for about three days. For the last three days, alone, without characters, I depersonalized myself and take myself off as if taking off clothes. I depersonalize myself so much that I fall asleep. I love Lispector so much. Yeah. Because I that's... feel like what she's doing here is like she's, she, she blends all of it together. She blends her, the author, herself with the narrator, the narrator with the characters. They all kind of become one slurry when she says, I want to be a pig and a hen, or when the narrator, mm-hmm. I want to... I want to be a pig and a hen and then kill them and drink their blood. Le Spectre becomes the narrator. The narrator becomes Maccabea and then lives this life and experiences this symbolic life in this symbolic death. Mm. You know, And she says, I have nothing better to do in the world while I wait for death, which is to live these alternate lives through fiction. Yeah. And to die these symbolic deaths through fiction. And this was her final book, and Maccabea has a lot of very a lot of similarities to Lispector's life in terms of being from this region, growing up poor. Although Lispector wasn't like destitute or was not but... like Maccabea, no. Yeah. I think having that information surrounding the novel enhances and enriches the novel, actually. Because usually I try not to read into those sort of prefaces prior to reading the story, but I did this time, and I'm glad I did, actually. Because it really mm-hmm. helped get that experience of watching this author do that that magic of living through the characters and exposing something of herself. Like that quote that you read it really does feel like she was telling something honestly about her own opinions about writing and what she thought of the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on that, uh, she writes a lot or (laughs) she or he, whatever, write a lot about reality. Like this book is only about reality. There's it's only facts. It's only actions. She's not interested in the fictions. What do you think, what is she saying about reality? Or what is the story saying about reality? Oh, that's a tricky one. Because there's things that will undermine anything I want to say, I think. 
when I start to think about it. I, I always I get this impression with this book and I got it with the chandelier too like her language the way that it, it, her her the sort of poetic ecstasy that she writes with it's like she's constantly trying to rip language apart so that she or the reader can glimpse beyond language at something surprising almost like a Zen Cohen yeah you know, it's you think you know where it's going and then there's some absurdity or it sums itself up in a riddle that doesn't actually resolve and in in that moment of of mental chaos and confusion you see you 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 might glimpse a reality beyond description i feel like that's what she's like that's what she's trying to do and in this case that's what the narrator is trying to do and for all of her her humor and playful use of language, I can't help but take Lispector so seriously. Like she's the most serious author who's really trying to penetrate what is what is actual reality. I think what you're saying is correct. I think there is something to that. And there, there's another quote, which I just flipping through, trying to find something else came across on page 28 and says, as for me, I've only escaped from being just a fluke because I write, which is an act that is a fact. That's when I enter into contact with inner powers of mine. I find through myself your God. Why do I write? What do I know? No idea. Yes, it's true. I sometimes think that I'm not me. I seem to belong to a distant galaxy because I'm so strange to myself. Is this me? I'm frightened to encounter myself. So this is the narrator. This is this. the narrator, yeah. And then listen to this. Because <laughs> this is what the narrator then says about Maccabea a few pages later. In the little superstition imaginings, she thought that if by any chance she ever got a nice, good taste of living, she'd suddenly cease to be the princess she was and be transformed into vermin. Because no matter how bad her situation, she didn't want to be deprived of herself. She wanted to be herself. She thought she'd incur serious punishment and even risk dying if she took too much pleasure in life. So she protected herself from death by living less, by consuming so little of her life that she'd never run out. This savings gave her a little security, since you can't fall further than the ground. Did she feel she was living for nothing? I'm not sure, but I don't think so. Only once did she ask a tragic question. Who am I? It frightened her so much that she completely stopped thinking. But I, who can't quite be her, feel that I live for nothing. I am gratuitous and pay my light, gas, and phone bills. As for her, she sometimes, occasionally on payday, bought a rose. <laughs> and that's one of those like nice little turnarounds at the end that she does that that you mentioned that w sometimes occasionally on payday she bought a rose it's really so hard to to get at what she's doing because it seems like what she's doing is like you said sort of stripping away stripping away being to its like foundations and finding some mysterious thing that can't be explained. Mm -hmm. And you see it in the opening line too, right? The opening and closing line, actually, which really work well together, which is all the world began with a yes. One molecule said yes to another molecule and life was born. And yeah, just the very last sentence is just yes of the book. I mean, it, it follows one of her non sequiturs, <laughs> which is, don't forget that for now it's strawberry season. Yes. Ah, <laughs> uh, I just, I love it so much. It's, it's strawberry season. Go pick the strawberries. That's all it is. Yeah. That's life. Go pick the strawberries. <laughs> you will die. It, it, and you don't know why. It's, it's incredible that this book is 80 pages or whatever it is. 
it it, it kind of like it would seem like it would be forced to try to cover the sort of mystical philosophical ground in that amount of pages and it never feels forced it always feels like this dance of language yes and it only when you start to try to pinpoint exactly what it is that she's saying i think it might it might feel contrived but in reading it that it, it never to me it never did it never felt like she was kind of getting too heady or too woo woo or whatever it's it's like this this dance this struggle with language yeah you you are in a dance with her language because there and it, it's a dance that she seems to know the moves to but maybe improvising but yeah. you as a reader are definitely definitely improvising along on a first read because there's a lot of turns there's a lot of twists that just don't really make sense and i'm not talking about narrative turns and twists in terms of plot but like actual language itself the way she she will shift focus she will shift in grammar or syntax sometimes mid sentence in ways that just feel so unusual but Speaking of what she's trying to do, there's another quote, and now you know we really love this book because we just keep quoting it. Um, <laughs> so it said, Could it be that by entering the seed of her life, I'm violating the secret of the pharaohs? Will I get the death penalty for speaking of a life that contains, like all our lives, an inviolable secret? I'm desperately trying to find in this girl's existence at least one topaz of splendor. Maybe I'll find it in the end. I still don't know, but I have hope. And I think that seems to be at least kind of what she's doing. And she's doing it through one character for another character, but she's doing it for both of the characters in some way. And in some way, I think, for the writing process. Because there's a sense that the narrator, at least, doesn't, know how the story is going to end even in the end when you're reading it at first it's like oh she's definitely going to die but then the narrator kind of pulls back says no 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 i don't want her to die i think that would be too you know whatever cliche or something it's just not it just doesn't suit her character and then of course she does she does die almost as the if the prince of darkness wins yeah that's right but there, yeah, there's this sense of like trying to capture, even in someone who seems to have nothing, or maybe because she has nothing. There's that there's that line early on about those who lack in richness of uh, uh, wealth. Yeah. I, it's it's like a common sort of phrase. He who is not poor in money is poor in spirit yes. or longing, because he lacks something more precious than gold. There are those who lack the delicate essential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Which there's begs the question: <laughs> what What is the delicate essential? Yeah, yeah. And maybe that's what maybe that's what she's maybe that's kind of the question. Mm. What is the delicate essential of Maccabea? I mean, it seems to be her her innocence and her mm -hmm. like. The narrator often refers to her as being a dog who doesn't know it's a it's dog. It's a dog. But there's another line, and I don't know where it is in the book. I wish I quoted it. But where the narrator sort of describes her as grass. That's at the oh, yeah, very here. end, right? When she's looking in the gutter. There's two parts. So on page 21, it's talking about how she forgot that she... She no longer remembered the taste of having parents. And she said, and he says, and if she thought about it, she might say she sprouted from the soil of the Alagoas backlands, like an instantly molded mushroom. She talked, yes, but was extremely mute. And it goes on. But then like two pages later, it's talking about life on Acre Street. The roosters crowing and the blood red dawn gave fresh meaning to her withered life. In the morning, there were chirping birds on Acre Street because life sprouted from the ground, cheerful amidst the stones. It's, it's just a very subtle little mm. like connection back to this idea of like sprouting from the ground. So that kind of gets to this idea that, that she sort of does live in this 
natural state, this mm. pre-fallen state, this innocent state, which is something that, well, just it just occurred to both of us, I guess, independently. Mm. This a sort of metaphor for a fall from grace, basically, that, that, that this whole book is a sort of metaphor for a fall from grace. Yeah. It certainly feels that way. That Grace is mentioned earlier in the book when she's uh, she has like moments to herself. It says here, one day she had an ecstasy. It was in front of a tree that was so big she could never wrap her arms around its trunk. But despite the ecstasy, she did not abide with God. She prayed indifferently. Yes, but the mysterious God of other people gave her a state of grace. Happy, happy, happy. Her soul almost flying. And she'd also seen a flying saucer. She tried to tell Gloria, but couldn't. She didn't know how to talk. And to tell her what? The air? You can't tell everything, because the everything is a hollow nothing. It's calling back to that idea of a loss of grace, or a fall from grace. And we can get to that ending where she she sort of receives this knowledge of the life she could have and an awareness of her own, I think wretched life is how it's phrased. So it says she goes to visit the uh, fortune teller who <laughs> is also very funny, former yeah. <laughs> prostitute, then a madame. Now <laughs> a fortune teller who munches on bonbons while reading people's yeah. futures. Yeah. Her and name she's is... not even, she's not even like trying to No, <laughs> not, not even. <laughs> Yeah, and she, she's she got a captive audience in Makabea. She's like, oh, do you want to start this, or can I keep talking? And Makabea's like, oh, yeah, please talk. And she's just <laughs> rambling on about her entire life. Uh, her name is Madame Carlotta, and it says, Madame Carlotta had gotten everything right. Makabea was stunned. Only then did she see that her life was miserable. She felt like crying when she saw her other side. She who, as I said, had always thought she was happy. And then, of course, she immediately goes out in the street, gets hit by a car, and dies. And it, reading it with that metaphor in mind, it makes me think that there is a sort of uh, collapsing of all of these characters. Even even her death, even Makabea's death, is Lispector describes as that was a thought that she had, having, I think, gone to a fortune teller and stepped out and thought, wouldn't it be funny if I got hit by a yellow Mercedes right now? Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be funny? And so there's a reading, and I don't want to like try to explain away all of this, but it's it just occurs to me that there's a way of reading this that like Lispector herself, but all of us come from a place of like innocence. Mm. Lispector literally came from the same region as this girl, and then we look we look back on that. And we try to understand who is that who is that person who, despite everything whatever childhood you may have had, despite everything, lived in a state of innocence. Didn't You didn't know that you were poor. You didn't know that you were unhappy. You just were. And that, you know, maybe that, that mud puddle was enough to make you the happiest kid in the world because what else was there? And then at some point in your life, somebody says, no, there's a world out there and you can have it. And you say, oh, there's a world out there. I can have it. Doesn't this suck where I am now? <laughs> Yeah. And you then you can't go back. You can't go back to not knowing, to not living part of your existence in that future world that you might someday have. And then so so Makabea is the narrator. The narrator is not trying to go back and see this again. And we all kind of become that narrator of our own lives. Looking back and trying to understand that pre-fallen state. And that there's a sort of symbolic death in our own, in in our lives, where we get hit by that symbolic Mercedes. Yeah, <laughs> which I think it even the narrator refers to it as a symbolic moment, explicitly. Oh, does he? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Isn't there a line in there about? Oh. Uh... But who can tell if she wasn't needing to die? Because there are times when a person needs a little oh, yeah. bitty death and doesn't even know it. As for me, I substitute the act of death for a symbol of it. A symbol that can be summed up in a deep kiss, but not on a rough wall, 
but mouth to mouth in the agony of pleasure that is death. I who symbolically die several times just to experience the resurrection. I think there it is. There it is. Sometimes you got to die just so you can be resurrected as something else, something new. Maybe you can grow as the grass out of the gutter. That's right. <laughs> and be shed on by a lousy two-bit huckster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one question I wanted to ask you to totally change the direction of this conversation. Yeah. What does the what are the explosions? Uh, the parenthetical explosions. Yeah. At first, I didn't know what they were, and they they come in greater number as the novel progresses. And I think they come as Makabea begins to have more and more thoughts, right? Because early on, she tries not to think. She lives almost this Zen-like nothingness of existence, this grass. But they always come in moments of realization, almost like these sparks of molecules, mm. right? The the or the mm. the brain um, synapses sort of firing in her head. These little explosions of thought, of awareness, of realization. They seem to represent that to me, because they always come before some e- some emotion or some realization. Usually in the same sentence. I mean, it certainly goes with the the sort of description of Makabea and this idea that she lives in this animalistic, natural state of being. Do you think... So one reading of this could be of, you know, the, the social reading of this. Mm. Yeah, the, her, the her state of the sort poor. Of, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that was in the afterward, right? Her son was writing about how she always wanted to write. She cared about the poor in Brazil. It kind of shocked her how poor people could be. And she always wanted to do something to to help. And that this book, in a way, and I guess at the time, even having your character be, you know, having your protagonist be somebody from the tenements was kind of a, a new thing. That wasn't something that people were writing about. So the sort of a sort of social reading of this could be that that this it's about the 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 misery or the the impoverished state of so many people in Rio de Janeiro. If that were true, I mean, I can't imagine the Spectre trying to create a social realist sort of fiction. Uh, the style seems to put a barrier between that in terms of having her exist as a fiction within the fiction. And maybe there's a reason for that with that socialist reading or social reading, rather. I don't know what that would be off the top of my head. At least half of the book is about creating the narrative and the writer writing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's references to the social aspects, and I think it's definitely a vein that runs through the novel. But it would be hard to read the entire book that way, in my mind. Yeah, well, me too. I mean... One way to summarize it, <laughs> you you could summarize it in a way that sounds like that's accurate. You say, hey, you know, it's a story about this girl who's she work she's working, but she's poor. She only can afford a room or one bed among four beds in a bedroom. Uh, she's so poor she only eats hot dogs. She's malnourished. She goes to the doctor and she's like she has tuberculosis, and she dies tragically and absurdly and is forgotten and that sounds like that sort of sort of that could be a socialist realist kind of story like isn't it isn't it tragic isn't it sad isn't it terrible but Lispector ter- kind of turns that whole thing on its head and the the character who's kind of in this story who kind of is the most pitiable is really the narrator who is you know whose life is you know, who has experienced success in writing and belongs to the upper middle class or what have you, and, but who feels that their life is extraneous, that all they do is go day to day paying their their gas bill. And what's the point of that? So she kind of turns out it's on, on its head. And, it, you know, I think maybe there's, 
if you read it in a literal way, you can kind of take issue with that because you don't want to presume that the, you know, the poor people are living in a state of a, a natural state and are happy to be in that natural state. That kind of seems not fair. Yeah, but in general, I'm against all readings in totality of looking at a character and saying, well, because this character feels this or does this or says this, then somehow that character is representative of all characters who share some sort of quality. That seems absurd to me. I, but I don't you, think you, you you kind of end up there when you think about when you read something with a social as a social commentary, right? I mean, sure. I'm I'm sure there's people out there that can read it this way. I mean. Her own child seems to read it this way, at least in part, yeah. uh, seems yeah. to make an argument for that. And I, I don't think that argument's invalid necessarily. I just don't think that seems to be the primary force of the novel, which we've already kind of discussed of what what are the things that she's sort of doing and seemingly concerned with. Yeah. It's not to diminish those those concerns either necessarily because i think they're there and they're there probably for a reason to to bring some light to it but i, I wouldn't say it's the primary yeah. concern of, of of the narrative yeah and i agree with you and i think one of the things that is special about the way that she writes this to me is that she seems able to say kind of two things at once yeah like like the doctor i thought was an interesting character <laughs> yeah someone that like is he, helping the poor but seems to despise them and is working yeah. just so he could get enough money to do nothing, I think is one of the lines. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he's, what was it he said? He's, he's like, he he's pretending that he doesn't understand that, he's like, you should eat more. Kind of refusing to believe that she's that poor. Yeah. That she's just kind Something of Something along like, those lines, yeah. I mean, virtually starving. Yeah. He's like, you should try spaghetti bolognese. It's really good. It's really good. See, look at me. I'm, like, I'm, I'm so fat and full of yeah. spaghetti and beer. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, it's definitely there. There's a line where she is finally, someone buys her a coffee and she fills oh, it yeah. with so much sugar. It almost makes her sick. But in her mind, it's like, this is the only chance I can have to have sugar. So I'm just going to pack this cup of coffee with sugar and milk because otherwise yeah. I'll, I'll miss the opportunity. Yeah, those issues are are not irrelevant. I think they're they're very they're much integral to the character and how. Ah, the, nonetheless, I would say that aspect. I don't think it overrides the metaphysical concerns and the issues of becoming aware of a life that you could have lived, and and I mm -hmm. think there there is an aspect of it that maybe might be more true for those who grow up impoverished that that awareness can yeah so so if that's true then what is this what is the, what is the novel saying that that such knowledge would can kill you is that <laughs> that seems like a terrible way to read the book actually i don't think that can't be right. <laughs> or that maybe the the yellow Mercedes is just the rich indiscriminately running down the poor. I don't, yeah. I don't. <laughs> well, there's the other reading that her son suggested, which was that there's an element of a Mercedes is a German vehicle. Ah, uh, yes. That was manufactured during the war. Le Spectre is Jewish. Maccabea is a reference to the, Ma the Maccabees, yeah. which was a, uh, uprising of traditional Jews in Judea against a Hellenistic, a, 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 what had become a dominant Hellenistic culture. Yeah, and you got um, Olympic or Olympico. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and Olympico. Olympus. Yeah. So there's, all, there's like this other layer that you could read. Mm. And is it is it and maybe like her language? I mean, is it possible that these things, that these layers don't cohere? They just coexist <laughs> on each other yeah. yeah it feels that way and maybe it's because it doesn't become like one is... thing oh it's about one thing they just kind of are in proximity i think her style lends itself to that possibility 
because it's it's this floating unreal experience and and if it were told in a more direct simple fact-based way or something i think Mm -hmm. you'd be forced into a reading and it might still be a really good book perhaps but it would lose i think the allure of of what she does so well which puts you in a like she makes you feel like you're in a state of unreality yeah it's like hypnotic i mean just just the quote here about her not having much of an inner life or inner awareness uh, this one really stuck out and it's she had what's known as an inner life and didn't know it she lived off herself as if eating her own entrails When she went to work, she looked like a gentle lunatic, because as the bus went along, she daydreamed in loud and dazzling dreams. These dreams, because of all that interiority, were empty because they lacked the essential nucleus of... of ecstasy, let's say. Most of the time, she had, without realizing it, the void that fills the souls of the saints. Was she a saint? So it seems. She didn't know that she was meditating because she didn't know what the word meant but it seems to me that her life was a long meditation on the nothing. Except she needed others in order to believe in herself. Otherwise she'd get lost in the successive and round emptiness inside her. She meditated while she was typing, and that's why she made even more mistakes. (laughs) Yeah. I really like this book, and... This is the second time I read. I wrote it. I, I, second time I read it, mm. um, and I don't remember. I didn't like it the first time. I didn't like oh, it very much. I thought it was. I thought I felt. I felt like the narrator was kind of contrived. It feels that way a little bit at the beginning, I would say. But you kind of grow into it quickly. At least I did. I, I mean, the very like first page or two pages, I was like, "Ugh, this feels." Yeah, very contrived, very forced. Even though I liked some of the language, like it has a great opening line, which I read earlier. But then once he starts revealing himself a little more, I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't care about this. But that, I think yeah. that's just kind of an initial reaction to someone who's distasteful. But uh-huh. that doesn't, it doesn't necessitate disliking of the book. You know, usually bad narrators bad characters can write amazing books you know lolita is like one of the big ones but yeah here we have something like that so but i i I just fell into it rather quickly i think two pages three pages in i was hooked but yeah it's a book you can you should read twice too because it it just opens itself (laughs) up to all sorts of different little connections and there's a real strong parallelism happening between the beginning and the end that I didn't pick up until like right before we started recording, I read the, oh. the, the first few pages again and I was like, Oh wow. There's like a lot of the imagery that she closes the book with. I mean, I didn't even pick up on the first line and the last line that's, and there it is, but yeah. Yeah. It's she there. kind of sets a lot of the stuff up at the very beginning in a very beautiful way. Mm. Yeah. It's a great book. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's really, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It makes me want to read more Lispector. Yeah. This is not our first and probably not our last Lispector because, yeah, I I just want to keep reading her. (laughs) She's so good. Yeah. Maccabea, Hail Mary, full of grace, serene promised land, land of forgiveness. The time must come. Ora pro nobis. And I use myself as a form of knowledge. I know you to the bone through an incantation that comes from me to you to scatter oneself wildly and yet behind everything pulses an inflexible geometry Maccabea remembered the docks the docks went to the heart of her life Maccabea asked for forgiveness because one always does for what? answer that's the way it is because that's the way it is was that the way it always was? it always will be and if it wasn't but I'm telling you it is so then.
Thanks for listening. If you want to hear more about Clarice Lispector, check out the Books of Some Substance podcast, episode 64, which we recorded on her book, The Chandelier. Our next episode is going to be on Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow. It's going to be the first of two episodes on this book. In the first episode, we're going to discuss an approach to reading this seminal work. If you haven't purchased this book yet, use the affiliate links on our website to support this podcast and local bookstores. And finally, hit those like and subscribe buttons. This makes sure that you don't miss any episodes, but it also is really helpful for helping other people discover the podcast. Once again, thanks for listening and happy reading.